Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Rula Deeb. I'm a senior principal at Geosyntac Consultant in Oakland, California, and I have the pleasure of co-facilitating today's event with my colleague, Dr. Jennifer Nyman. This webinar focuses on DOD-funded research efforts to advance the accuracy and promote the use of passive samplers at PFAS-impacted sites. We will have two presentations. First, Dr. Upal Ghosh from the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. will talk about the development of novel functionalized polymeric thin films to improve equilibrium passive sampling in surface water and groundwater. Second, Dr. Andrew Jackson from Texas Tech University will talk about the performance of a high resolution passive profiler relative to traditional monitoring methods from two field deployments. Each of the two presentations will be followed by a brief Q&A session, and depending on how we're doing on time, we will conclude the webinar with a longer Q&A session. The next two provide instructions on optimizing your webinar experience. If you have not done so already, you can download Zoom at the link shown here, and provide it to you in your webinar registration confirmation email. If you cannot download Zoom, you can still view the slides using a compatible internet browser such as Firefox, IE, or Edge, and by creating a free Zoom account. If you have difficulties viewing the slides or if your screen freezes, try keying in Control and F5 to perform a hard refresh of your browser. And in case of continued difficulties, just download a PDF of the slides from the webinar webpage and call into the conference line provided to you in your webinar registration confirmation email. Another viewing option is to go to the CERTIP and ESTCP YouTube channel at the link uh, shown here as we will be live streaming today's um, broadcast. Note that the webinar will be listen only. You can submit questions by using the Q&A box on your screen. You do not need to wait until the Q&A period to submit your questions. We do encourage you to get them in as soon as you think of them. And when you submit your questions, we ask that you add your organization name at the end of your question so that we can identify you. Please do not submit questions in the chat box. The chat box is reserved for comments related to logistical issues. With that, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Hunter Anderson, who just this Monday joined the CERTUP and ESCCP program office as a subject matter expert in the environmental restoration program area. And before that, Hunter uh, was with the Air Force Civil Engineering Center since 2010, providing technical support in the areas of emerging contaminants, environmental engineering, environmental toxicology, and quantitative data analysis. Hunter received his doctoral degree in environmental chemistry from The Ohio State University. Hunter, we're delighted to have you. Please kick us off. Yeah, thank you, Rula, and welcome everyone to today's uh, webinar series. As Rula mentioned, I'm the newest addition to the program office, and I'll be stepping in for Dr. Leeson to kind of lighten her load on a few things. Uh, just so everyone's aware, by way of overview here, uh, speaking for the entire program office, uh, CERTIP is congressionally mandated. Both CERTIP and ESTCP are embedded in the DASD for Energy Resilience and Optimization, uh, headquartered in the Pentagon. Sort of specifically is congressionally mandated. It's a collaboration between DOD, uh, DOE, and EPA. Um, sort of is basic research, whereas ESTCP is a DOD specific program that strives to uh, translate the basic research funded under CERTIP into a sort of field ready capability. And the webinars you'll hear today represent uh, investments from both CERTIP and ESTCP. <clears throat> and go to slide 11. Uh, focus areas, the bottom line here is that if it's an environmental issue for the DOD, it's a it's a focus area for CERTIP and ESTCP. Uh, I would just say that the program office, the, the program office constantly reinvents itself to be relevant to you know the environmental needs of the day uh, to the department. <laughs> Slide 12, please. 
Um, you know, I'll just say for projects and impacts, the DOD constantly, you know, is in the press, you know, for these environmental issues, you know, as, as being somewhat, you know, with a negative, some, somewhat of a negative reputation. We, you know, we get a lot of bad press for, you know, some of these environmental issues, but sort of in ESTCP have really been, you know, the, the uh, poster child for the good work the DOD does to, you know, better these environmental liabilities. And, you know, in, in my opinion, we've kind of led the way internationally with some of the funding initiatives to address these environmental challenges, um, you know, and so constantly, you know, we get a lot of international attention uh, from the work that we do um, as the entire world sort of looks at us for, you know, guidance on how to respond to these, um, you know, environmental challenges uh, of the day. Slide 13. So, yeah, like I said, CERTIP's basic research, uh, CERTIP's mostly, you know, represented by academic, you know, research entities, uh, you know, universities, et cetera. Uh, whereas ESTCP, the, the more field applied, you know, work we invest in is often dominated by, you know, industry, you know, entities with, you know, collaboration from academic entities. Whereas our, our federal research partners are, you know, represent sort of an equal cross section of the other two. Uh, slide 14, please. <clears throat> so these two webinars today are specific to PFAS. Our PFAS portfolio is extensive. Uh, this figure is, is, a, is an image from one of the interactive uh, features on the website where we uh, showcase the entire portfolio. Each of these boxes represent entire cohorts of projects. The, the boxes on the top represent workshops, strategic planning workshops we've, we've conducted in the past where you know, we get a lot of smart people together and, and identify data gaps that, you know, then are compiled and, and become the fodder for future, you know, investments as, as we translate those needs into statements of need for our solicitations. Uh, but you can go to the website and click on these boxes and it'll bring up each of those projects that we funded. Uh, those both of those that have been completed and those that are in progress. Uh, and again, it's a it's a pretty uh, efficient way to get a, a really quick snapshot of, of everything we've funded to date. Uh, next slide, 15. So today's webinar, you know, again, is on these passive samplers for, for PFAS that, you know, again, represent both CERP and ESTCP investments. The next, um, the next webinar uh, will be on September 12th and will feature results from two projects on developing and dem uh, demonstrating PFAS destruction technology. So another uh, a PFAS webinar. Um, and so with that, let's go to slide 16. Uh, there's a website you can get information, you know, on all these webinars. Again, the, the website's a pretty comprehensive source of information for all these different investments. Uh, next slide, 16. And I just wanted to also make a plug for the uh, upcoming symposium. At the end of the year, first week in December, we do this uh, every year where we showcase, you know, the entire portfolio, not just restoration, but all the focus areas. So, you know, it's a week-long uh, conference where, uh, yeah, we showcase the best of the best and, and, you know, we facilitate a lot of discussion and uh, it, it's a really good way to sort of get plugged in with passion and, you know, we welcome feedback and, and make these um, engagements more productive and often, you know, seek, you know, the opportunity to engage with the public and uh, industry in general to, you know, discuss what we're doing and, and, and again, strive to uh, always make things better. So yeah, with that, uh, welcome everyone. And I'll hand it back to you. Great, thank you so much, Hunter. It is now my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, uh, Dr. Upal Ghosh, who is a professor in the Department of Chemical, Biochemical and Environmental Engineering at the University of Mary Maryland, Baltimore County. Upal's research performs um, Upal's research group uh, does research on the fate, effects, and remediation of toxic pollutants in the environment. Um, the research group has contributed to the development of monitoring tools, including passive sampling for pollutant bioavailability. Uh, more broadly, Dr. Gosh's research contributions have been recognized with multiple awards, including the University System of Maryland Regents Award for Excellence in Scholarship, Research, and Creative Activity. 
He is a co-founder of two startup companies, Sediment Solutions LLC and Rambach Environmental, to transition novel sediment remediation technologies to the field. In terms of educational background, Upal has an undergraduate degree in chemical engineering from the Indian Institute of Technology and master's and doctoral degrees in environmental engineering from the State University of New York at Buffalo. Uh, Upa, we're so glad to have you. Uh, please start your presentation. Thank you, Rolok. Can you hear me? Am I yes. audible? Yeah, thank you. And uh, also thank you, uh, Hunter, for the introduction to the SERDUP SECP program. So it's my pleasure to talk about uh, the project here. So this uh, uh, SERDUP project, um, is a seed project. So Startup also funds these high risk, um, uh, typically one year projects, which uh, are designed to uh, demonstrate proof of concept of an idea, which is then uh, if that works out, it goes on to a full uh, sort of project. So this is an example of such a project that we just completed and we have moved to the next phase, which is a full project that we started this year. Um, early this year. So the presentation is going to focus on the outcome of the seed project uh, that we completed. And uh, the final report is also available at the CERDUP uh, website. So the basic idea here in this uh, uh, research project, the seed project was to do show proof of concept of the development of functionalized polymeric thin films for uh, performing passive sampling um, of PFAS in surface and groundwaters. And uh, the presentation here is going to uh, kind of follow this outline with, with uh, the problem statement, uh, objectives and approaches, and, the, and uh, a summary of the key findings and then some conclusions and next steps. Um, so let me start here with a quick introduction, one slide introduction of passive sampling. Um, the freely dissolved concentrations are directly linked to exposure, and this is true for polar and nonpolar organics and also ionizable compounds and metals. And there is a long history of the development of passive sampling uh, of various kinds tailored to different uh, contaminants of interest um, to be able to inform key um, assessment objectives in the environmental monitoring and uh, remedy decisions. And these would be um, uh, phase uh, transfers going, uh, for example, um, the uh, sediment phase and the water phase are water phase are very importantly be able to inform um, the bio of these pollutants into the aquatic organisms. Uh, so passive sampling has uh, been successfully applied for many of these contexts, especially for hydroorganic compounds and metals. And the setup program has funded some of the previous work and uh, some of that I and a uh, key um, outcome of that those efforts was uh, this document that came out uh, a few years ago on, uh, uh, it's an user manual for uh, passive sampling for contaminant sediments. But that's focused on uh, hydrophobic organics like PCBs, PHs, dioxins, and so forth. We're taking the same construct and then looking at uh, what we need to do to be able to do equilibrium passive sampling and get all the benefits of passive sampling for PFAS related problems. Um, one, of the, one of the key benefits of passive sampling of course is that instead of uh, a snapshot measurement with a grab sample taken on a particular day and time, the passive samplers are typically put out in the environment for a period of time which allows it to integrate over a period of time um, the concentration, which is um, more reflective of a longer term exposure concentration for aquatic organisms. So it provides the value of time integration without having to do multiple samples and analysis. For PFAS compounds, of course, 
we all know about the challenges. Uh, EPA has released health advisories for several of these compounds. And the risk assessment paradigm for PFAS compounds is still being um, under scientific and regulatory development. But we are following here a path that is analogous to existing paradigm for both polar and non-polar pollutants in the aquatic environment, which is that the dissolved concentration measurement and doing that measurement accurately is really critical to be able to define the chemical activity of the pollutant, which is related to exposure, toxicity, and exchange between phases. Um, so the, the, the passive sampling approach here for um, um, PFAS compounds, we are following an equilibrium passive sampling method, which um, is focused on the dissolved PFAS compounds in water. Um, and those can be related then to compound specific bioconcentration factors. Um, the equilibrium passive sampling for the amphiphilic uh, PFAS compounds is still in the early stage of development because there are uh, several challenges with extending that approach to PFAS compounds. And one of those challenges is that we have a range of properties of these large number of molecules. Uh, one of the most well-studied PFAS uh, passive sampler um, are, the, uh, are the kinetic samplers, uh, the, the POSIS or the DGT type samplers. There are a few challenges with passive uh, sampling with the kinetic mode where uh, the kinetics of uptake is related to uh, the dissolved concentration um, driving force. It, it can be uh, worked around, but uh, the approach we are taking is an equilibrium approach where the sampler reaches an equilibrium or approaches an equilibrium over a period of time of exposure. And that has worked very well for several other types of chemicals. And if it doesn't reach equilibrium, there are approaches to understand what phase of equilibrium the passive samplers are in using what we call performance reference compounds. So the equilibrium sampler medium um, that's chosen for PFAS compounds have to be tailored to the range of properties of these PFAS compounds. And we want to be able to take the information that comes out of this and link it to um, risk assessment or bioaccumulation models. And one that we are tracking and having an uh, 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 we, we believe we'll be able to inform with the PFAS uh, passive sampling approach is a chemical activity-based risk assessment. And I would refer um, the audience to a uh, 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 wonderful study done by Frank Gobus and his team, uh, which is uh, the final report of that is available in the CERDAP website, uh, which basically looks at uh, a three-step process. Uh, determining the PFAS activity in the ambient environmental media. So that could be the sediment media or the aqueous phase um, to which organisms may be, or aquatic food web may be exposed to. Uh, the step two would be, and that first step is what uh, the passive sampling approach will be able to inform. And then that would then lead to the uh, second step, which would be determining the PFAS, uh, PFAS activity in target organisms. Um, using activity ratios, and then comparing the estimated PFAS activity in organisms with those associated with biological effects. So um, we uh, hope to be able to inform these approaches for risk assessment using the passive sampling approach here. Um, so the technical objectives here uh, is to develop these uh, functionalized polymeric thin films that are tailored for PFAS compounds experimentally measure these uh, um, uh, partition constants you know, for selected PFAS compounds using isotherm models um, and evaluate the kinetics of sorption. Kinetics are critical to understand. How long does it take for the different PFAS compounds to um, get to a certain stage of equilibrium within the sampler? And then be very clear about the mechanism of accumulation. Is it all surface adsorption that's going on or is it going into the uh, material and um, it is really um, absorbing into the matrix? And that's an important one to figure out. Um, so the first part of this approach was developing the materials for 
the equilibrium sampling, passive sampling for PFAS. And the approach we took here is uh, uh, similar to something we did for, on uh, another CERDA project several years ago, extending passive sampling to mercury and methyl mercury. So what we did for methyl mercury, and it worked very well, is um, we took a polymer and then put inside the polymer active materials that have specific affinity for the target compound. So in that case, it was methyl mercury. So we are using that same construct and applying that for PFAS compounds. And so in this uh, seed project, we started off with a very large matrix of materials that we wanted to try out and see which ones would um, uh, uh, show promise for PFAS passive sampling. So there are two things here that we are starting off with. One is the base polymer, and that base polymer in our case was either agarose or PDMS, polydimethyl siloxane, or cellulose acetate. And within those polymers, um, we uh, put in, um, inserted PFAS uh, specific um, sorbent materials. And these included activated carbon. Activated carbon is still used very uh, widely for uh, treatment of PFAS in uh, uh, groundwater and contaminated waters. Um, it uh, uh, has a wide range of uh, sorption capacities for the different compounds. And then we also targeted some of the media that are specifically designed for PFAS and is used in solid phase extraction in the analytical um, um, aspect of PFAS compounds. And then finally, uh, an exciting uh, material that we are continuing to work with, um, and we did the initial proof of concept in the seed project, is serum albumins. So the serum albumins um, are a primary uh, 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 target uh, molecule that uh, is responsible for PFAS absorption and transport within the animal and has specific affinity for PFAS compounds. So our approach here is to take the sorbents, including the serum albumin, and then insert it inside the polymer to create a new passive sampling thin film that would act as an equilibrium passive sampler in the field. So as you see in the top right picture there, um, there's a base polymer, then we um, create it with the uh, we'll embed it with the uh, with the sorbent materials in the synthesis phase, and then we cast the film using a casting method that allows us to get uh, defined thicknesses of the polymers, and then we do different kinds of tests with those polymers. So here are some of the polymers as one would see them under a light microscope. So if you see the picture on the right, there are different combinations of say, uh, the first column is agarose, the second column is cellulose acetate, and the third column is PDMS. And within that, the top row is just the base polymer. And then the, the remaining rows have um, the different adsorbent materials that have been embedded within the polymer. Uh, to embed the human serum albumin, we actually uh, purchased the human serum albumin that was pre-coated on silica beads, and then those were then inserted into the agarose um, film. So we were able to cast these films in thicknesses of 180 or 300 or 1,000 microns. We, um, first of all, we check the structural stability of the polymers that we make and make sure that it can be deployed in the field, put it in a uh, beaker with uh, water being stirred around to see if uh, structurally they hold up and so forth. Um, we uh, synthesized a total of 15 passive samplers and uh, tested them in the lab. Um, and the initial screening was based on single point isotherms and then we did full isotherms and then we did the kinetic uh, studies. So an isotherm might look something like this where we put the beaker, uh, uh, put, a, put a bottle um, on a shaker um, and in the bottle, we have uh, spiked water with target PFAS compounds. Our seed project looked at seven PFAS compounds. You see the list on the top left there. Those were the ones that we tested. Um, 18 nanograms per liter PFAS. And then 
you put the sampler in there and then we are trying to assess here what the distribution is between the water phase and the polymer phase. And then the polymer is extracted, the uh, water is extracted, and we also had to keep track of mass balance and looked at how much remains on the uh, bottle. Um, and then it, uh, we do for the water and all these uh, extracts and it goes through um, uh, the standard analytical uh, uh, method with an LCM SMS that does the analysis. And I have to, I, I should mention here, I forgot in the first slide uh, that this project was a collaboration between the University of Maryland, Baltimore County and George Mason University. And my co-PI at George Mason University, uh, uh, Greg Foster um, uh, helped with all the analytical measurements here for this project. Uh, we started off with uh, interlab comparison with the DOD ELAP lab uh, certified lab at Clarkson University to compare our results and the initial the, the the comparison looked good, so that allowed us to move on to looking at these petitioning experiments. So what you see in this these isotherms are the, some of the some of the different polymers that we made, and uh, the x axis are concentrations of the water phase, the y axis is concentration in the nanograms per kilogram in the polymer phase. And then we are looking at uh, different isotherm models to try to explain the behavior of uh, sorption in these polymers. So some of these polymers um, are giving somewhat linear uh, uh, adsorption isotherms. Some of them have uh, um, uh, are, are showing apparent nonlinearity in in sorption. Um, so for both short chain PFAS uh, and long chain PFAS, um, the isotherm models seem to fit well. The cellulose acetate plus the human serum albumin polymer show good linear fitting results with R square of uh, uh, 0.94 uh, for most of the PFAS compounds. Um, we looked at kinetics and this is a snapshot of some of the kinetic measurements and in the kinetic measurements, uh, multiple measurements are being made over time in these bottles uh, to track the concentration in the polymer and the water phase over time. So as you can see here for PFPA, P4, PFOS, and uh, the floor telomer, um, that uh, these, uh, uh, these compounds are coming to somewhat of an equilibrium within um, uh, within a few days. So if you look at the time point there and the x-axis, 100 days, um, most of these are coming to equilibrium in, in less than 100 days. Uh, maybe a few taking us a little longer. So our assessment from that is uh, in these gently mixed systems, um, we're talking about a few days of uh, time for equilibrium. Um, so we fitted the sorption kinetics, and again, the, uh, we are able to get a good first order um, uh, equation fit, uh, less than four days in a gently mixed situation. And um, uh, what you see on, in these plots, if I go back there, that what the way we have plotted these, uh, the x-axis is in time in hours, and the y-axis is log KD. So, um, it's so when the if you look at the log KD values, they are somewhere in the range of about three. So that's what we are getting with these polymers. And one thing to remember is that as we formulate these polymers, we have some flexibility in um, um, adjusting the absorption capacity by adjusting how much of uh, the materials we put in that are responsible for the absorption. So we're getting a log KD of about three, and um, in many of these compounds, uh, for many of these compounds, so these are capable of accumulating detectable and reproducible masses of PFAS in thin films and field relevant concentrations. So we're looking at passive sampler films that might be, say, um, a few hundred micron thick and a couple of inches uh, length and width, and that's enough for us to be able to get a detectable mass within the polymer for our analytical measurements. Um, 
and we can uh, manufacture these consistent thin films that are structurally stable in water. We also wanted to uh, uh, make sure that we can um, have some understanding of how the absorption behavior is working. Um, is it absorbing in and not never coming out? That would be a, a problem for uh, any um, uh, performance reference compound type approach for determining the kinetics. So what we did in uh, one set of kinetic experiments is with several of these um, polymers that we made is um, expose the polymer to a concentration in the water phase, let it absorb, reach equilibrium. So that's what you see here for um, the two sets, agarose plus AC and acetate plus wax. And uh, the compound we are tracking is PFOS here, uh, that it reaches equilibrium in about 100 days. We let it go for like 300 days and that's a stable equilibrium phase. And then we take the water out with the P dissolved PFAS in it and put clean water back in. So when we do that, we are changing the uh, direction of uh, chemical movement. So initially in during the absorption phase, the PFOS was absorbing into the polymer. Now I replace the water with clean water. So the PFOS is dissolving out of the polymer into the water phase. And then if I take it to the, uh, and wait for seven days and then uh, measure the concentration of PFOS in the polymer and the water phase. If it is a reversible equilibrium, I should get, I should come back close to um, where I was in the uh, KD value. So for these uh, two polymers, we see that for PFOS, we are getting close to our um, uh, adsorption equilibrium KD when, when we do the desorption test. So, uh, there's some variation here, but um, they're within the range of what we think would uh, uh, give us confidence that this is a reversible absorption process. Um, so uh, um, let me try to synthesize and tested polymers of uh, functionalized for absorption of a wide range of PFAS compounds. Uh, these can be fitted to models that can be used in a predictive way to go from polymer measurement to the water concentration estimate. The equilibrium is uh, about four days, so definitely less. Uh, it's a reversible absorption process, and we are able to accumulate detectable levels of uh, masses of PFAS and thin layers of deployment in field relevant concentrations. So here's a key publication that uh, came out of the SEED project. This is published in the Chemical Engineering Journal, journal and has the details of uh, the, uh, the, uh, the work. And uh, the key um, um, uh, performers for this project, and that's listed in this uh, key publication as well, postdoc uh, Dr. Song Jing Yang and, and Greg Foster, my co-PI at George Mason and I. Um, so we have transitioned to the next phase um, with a, a, a full setup project, which we started early this year, where we are uh, extending this work to um, look at uh, 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 25 PFAS components. We did only the seven selected ones for the seed project. We are going to be evaluating um, uh, sample absorption mechanism and performance under a range of water chemistry conditions that one would normally ex anticipate in surface and groundwater. We will, following the work that shows that this is a reversible equilibrium, we would be developing and demonstrating enriched stable isotope spikes as performance reference compounds to confirm equilibrium or to correct for non-equilibrium as necessary and test the ability to measure PFAS in natural surface water and evaluate robustness in long-term field deployments. So talking about uh, um, um, uh, field deployments, uh, we, we here are some pictures of how we anticipate this to work. And these are similar samplers, but this is these were designed for methyl mercury measurements. So we put these uh, samplers in this particular situation in um, um, uh, in, in these uh, little old. Um, old style uh, uh, photography slides. So they, they are nice uh, 
uh, form factor to do the passive sampling in, and then we can put them in the flowing water tied to a cinder block, or we can embed them into the mud. And then one of the beautiful things we can do is with the samplers, because they are, they are a sheet, we can put them in these critical zones in sediment, for example. So we're doing that for methyl mercury there, but it could be uh, done for PFAS as well, where, um, where there is a lot of gradient happening and that is critical to understand in terms of phase exchanges. We can cut these into very thin slices. Uh, in this case, we're doing a half a centimeter increment. So we can get a fingerprint or an imprint of pore water concentrations or surface water concentrations at very uh, narrow uh, 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 depths. Uh, so several benefits to DOD to be able to uh, implement some of these uh, uh, sampling approaches. Um, dissolved concentrations, as I said, are critical in understanding transport and bio-uptake. Uh, the concentrations we, we have with these passive samplers with the right size and uh, material, we can get down to the low detection limits that are often required, and we can provide that with a time integrated manner. Um, and we can, you know, the so accurate measurements, time integration, low detection limits, and high resolution depth profiling are some of the key advantages. Um, so there are some additional resources for those who uh, would like to see some of the details. Um, and I will hand it over back to Rula. Thank you. Thank you so much, Upal. And as a reminder to our audience, you can now submit questions to Upal um, using the Q&A box on your screen in Zoom. We have quite a few questions that have already come in. Um, first, can you talk about um, the temperature of the water during these experiments and whether that would make a difference? And um, the question was specifically about sorption kinetics, but could be interesting for uh, most of your experiments. Yes, I think that's that's a great question. Uh, uh, temperature um, has an impact definitely on the kinetics. Um, we would anticipate that. Now, all these experiments that we did in the uh, seed project, they were at room temperature 34 degrees, uh, 24 uh, degrees Celsius. Um, so uh, we don't have experimental measurements of how temperature is affecting. Um, but this is something that we would be looking at very closely in the ongoing phase of the project. Okay, great. And then what about um, desorption through heat? I um, think that at any point that he could denature the polymer specifically, this is a question from the Army Corps of Engineers. So will that be something that you're looking at, polymer denatur denaturation? Yeah, I think that's a, that's again a good, very good question. Um, so the polymers that we have worked with, the agarose, the uh, uh, cellulose acetate, and PDMS, for the ranges of temperatures we anticipate in the field, um, we are not concerned about the polymer itself. Uh, we have deployed the agarose. The agarose is the one which is the softest, and I would be concerned about if it would uh, not have not hold up. But we have deployed these in the field for our methyl mercury sampling, and agros gels are used quite a lot in the field for other types of um, um, uh, kinetic samplers. So I'm not too concerned about um, the polymer itself for the for the field temperatures that we might experience. Uh, but when we are looking at some of these materials like the proteins, we have to be really careful about denaturization of the uh, protein material. Um, so, uh, and both in the fabrication and the lab end of things and also in the field. So we looked at uh, the temperature range for uh, serum albumins. Um, if it denatures, of course, the uh, tertiary structure is gone and then the sorption is going to be impacted by that. Um, but they can go pretty high. We, we are talking about uh, in the 50s of Celsius that you have to be above 58 or 60 degrees to start denaturing uh, serum albumin. So that um, we are paying attention so that in the polymer formulation phase in the lab, we don't exceed that. And in the field, I am not 
that concern about the denaturization of the proteins. Okay, makes sense. Thank you. And the next question is um, comes to us from Prague. Um, what type of environmental sample collection are the films designed for, and what impact could high organic concentrations have on sorption capacity? Yes, those are those are very good questions. So um, um, the the target measurements here would be dissolved concentration, say in a river or a lake or a water body, where uh, the dissolved concentrations in the water is a critical measure to be able to inform um, processes that depend on chemical activity. So that would be um, uh, uptake into an organism or exchange between say groundwater and surface water at the sediment interface. Um, so those would be critical pieces of information that will come from passive sampling. Um, the second part of the question was, I'm forgetting that now, Rola, could you rem remind me the second part of the question? What's the impact of high organic matrices? So high dissolved organic uh, uh, content. So again, that is uh, um, um, that is uh, what we are testing in this second phase of this project. We haven't tested it, so I cannot give a uh, 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 answer based on measurements we have we have done. So we are going to try to frame that within um, these experimental. Um, uh, uh, conditions that we will impose to these samplers um, in in the second phase of this project. So we don't have data for that yet. Okay, understood. Thanks. Um, this next question is from the Naval Research Laboratory. Would you please um, let the audience know the analytical method that was used for determining the individual PFAS concentrations and comment on um, that method's accuracy or precision? Yeah, so it is a LCMSMS method with uh, uh, multiple reaction monitoring. Uh, it it follows the standard EPA method with few little changes. Um, and what we were able to do is, um, um, yeah, I think I showed one slide there. We, we did a comparison of our measurements. Uh, George, well, the measurements were done at George Mason University by Greg Foster. Uh, so we did a comparison of uh, his lab's uh, measurement with uh, a DOD ELAP lab to uh, give us the confidence that these measurements are accurate. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Um, and next, um, this question is from the Army Corps. Um, you talked about equilibrium conditions. Is that distinguished from saturation? And um, are the conditions far from saturating these thin films? Yes, again, this is a, this is a really good question and that's important to uh, keep in mind. So we are targeting the low end of the concentrations. Um, so if you um, um, Remember one of the slides where uh, I showed the water concentrations, the starting water concentrations were 80 nanograms per liter. So at those low concentrations, we are really talking about equilibrium happening and uh, um, um, an irreversible equilibrium. So that's one of the reasons we wanted to test and see if this is a reversible equilibrium type phenomena that uh, is indeed what's controlling what's going on into the polymers. Okay, thanks, understood. Um, and then we have a couple of folks who asked, um, who asked this question. Um, has your group collected data to show the desorption curves for different PFAS over time, rather than showing um, the one data point for the desorption test? Yeah, I think that's, that's something to, um, think about in terms of what that would tell us, what the the results that I showed from the SEED project was uh, focused on answering the question of uh, the adsorption equilibrium point versus the desorption equilibrium point, are they close enough to give us a sense of reversible equilibrium? So that was the motivation for that experiment. So we definitely needed to take it 
to an equilibrium and track that. So you saw the uh, different data points uh, over time, tracking the uh, kinetics reaching equilibrium. But then for the desorption, so once we like four days, we let it go for seven days. And then for the desorption, we just measured the seven day desorption point and we didn't track individual days up to seven days of desorption. So yes, we don't have data on the uh, kinetic approach to desorption value, um, but uh, given that it reaches a very similar desorption endpoint, we would anticipate that the desorption kinetics is very similar to the adsorption kinetics. Um, but this is something that we phase of the project. We haven't done that. Thank you. All right. And um, we're almost out of time, but we have so many good questions. Let's have one last question. Um, does the ratio between the polymer and the sorbent matter? And if so, what might that be? Yes, so so we played around with that ratio between the polymer and the sorbent, and there are multiple considerations here. Um, one is the strength and stability of the polymer. We cannot load it up with too much of um, solid material, then uh, it starts falling apart. So there are some limits to how much uh, adsorbent we can put into the polymer before it, we start uh, impacting the structural stability of the polymer. Um, but um, we um, we can tailor how much we put in, and that is what we are trying to learn from these ISOM um, uh, uh, KD values. What do we need? So for example, if you're doing a sediment deployment, um, we want to be able to reach a, K, uh, a distribution coefficient between the water phase or pore water phase and the sediment phase and the polymer phase, which is in the range of what the distribution is in natural sediments. So if you stay within that natural sediment distribution coefficient range, then you're not disturbing the, uh, the distribution that's happening in natural sediments. You're not creating a huge sink in a small space in the, in the, in the, in the sediment as you put these samplers in. Um, X kinetics and uh, several other uh, issues come up. So we are targeting a distribution that is similar to what natural sediments would have for these uh, polymers, uh, for for these for these compounds. So um, so we have looked at a different range of these, and typically these are about ten percent or so of the polymer mass. We start getting too much higher than that. It starts getting to be a problem with the structural stability of the polymer. Okay. Thank you so much, Upal, for the presentation and answering the questions. And Upal will come back at the end of the webinar to answer a few more questions as well. And now we're going to move to our next presenter, who is Dr. Andrew Jackson, the chair of the Department of Civil, Environmental, and Construction Engineering at Texas Tech. Andrew's research interests include the fate and transport of contaminants like perchlorate, heavy metals, PFAS, and chlorinated solvents in natural environments, and developing methods to study fate and transport processes at appropriate scales. Andrew is the recipient of several awards, including um, Environmental Science and Technology's Best Paper of the Year, CERTA Project of the Year, and the President's Teaching Award. He received a bachelor's degree from Rhodes College and master's and doctoral degrees uh, from Louisiana State University. Andrew, please proceed. Thank you. Uh, I'm happy to be here and um, share our results. Um, I'm going to be uh, talking a little bit about the technical objective of the project. This was an ESTCP, so it was a demonstration project. Um, give you a little background on how our passive sampler works. Um, it you know, uses a little bit different technology than uh, Gopal was discussing. Uh, talk about the deployment and sampling we did, and then hopefully focus on the results. 
and then end with what came out of that and some examples of benefits to DOD. I would like to say that there were two field deployments here. There's an enormous amount of data and I'm only giving examples of a little bit of it. So if anybody would like more information on anything, please contact me. Um, so the technical objective um, of this work was to um, demonstrate that this passive sampler, this direct drive uh, sampler uh, would return uh, information that is as good or superior than traditional technologies. Um, and so uh, the main objectives were to look to see if it would improve site conceptual models, um, improve modeling of fate and transport individual sites, and would it be able to monitor upwelling or exposure into um, surface waters. And so um, to do this, we had a, um, a couple of field sites, and this slide tries to kind of overview uh, what the whole project did. Uh, there'll be more information on each site individually later. Uh, but basically, we wanted to evaluate a, a traditional uh, uh, site where there's a source zone, um, there's uh, PFAS migrating groundwater down gradient, and then um, uh, when if it happens, a location where groundwater is upwelling into a surface water. And so we basically installed these samplers uh, within a source zone, down granite, and then within the sediment of a surface water um, and evaluated what we found compared to traditional methods of evaluation. So a little background on this, this is um, the, the, this sampler has been previously demonstrated for chlorinated solvents, um, heavy metals, um, hydrophobic organic compounds. Um, and so uh, the, this project was really focused on showing that it would also be appropriate for PFAS. So previously we've shown that this sampler can um, uh, be directly driven to at least 30 feet below ground surface. Um, that is really dependent upon the formation of uh, 30 feet. Um, the, the samplers can be coupled to any length you would like. So we've done four to 28 feet um, of uh, sample length. Um, the spatial resolution is you can be customized. Um, the groundwater samplers are generally about 10 centimeters spatial resolution, um, whereas the sediment samplers um, will go down to two centimeters spatial resolution. Um, the samplers have been shown to measure uh, uh, PFAS, um, uh, geochemical species, uh, other dissolved compounds, chlorinated solvents, BTEX, metals. Um, basically, anything that's dissolved in the pore water will equilibrate with these samplers. Um, it also measures pore water velocities, which is very useful because it allows you to look at mass flux uh, on a, a depth-dependent basis. Um, and it usually takes about uh, three weeks uh, for these to equilibrate. So three to four weeks is the typical field deployment time. So a little bit more about how this works. So this is a, a schematic of one segment of the sampler. This is a stainless steel rod. It's about four feet in length. This would be for the groundwater studies. Uh, there are different geometries for sediment, but they work on the same principle. Uh, you can see that they're threaded at both ends. So these can be coupled together to uh, uh, look at any depth uh, profile you would like. Uh, and the way the, the, the samplers uh, collect samples for concentrations, is uh, through diffusive equilibrium. So this is an equilibrium uh, sampler, it's not a kinetic. Um, and the samplers have uh, reservoirs that are milled into them, so these, these holes. Um, and these holes are filled with water um, and there's, the water is separated by a, a porous membrane, uh, 0 0.45 or 0 0.2 microns, depending on the, the uh, type of membrane used. For PFAS, we use a stainless steel membrane uh, which is also good because when we direct drive, it makes it very uh, rugged. And what happens over time is that anything that's dissolved in the pore water will migrate across that membrane into the reservoir just due to diffusive uh, uh, equilibrium. And eventually the concentration inside the cell will equal the concentration outside the cell. And this is important because it means that we don't have to do any back calculation using partition coefficients to determine the concentration which we think um, uh, removes some of the potential errors that could be possible. So uh, the one thing you do have to make sure of is that you uh, approach equilibrium. And so to evaluate that, we use a conservative tracer bromide. Uh, bromide will diffuse out of the cell 
And we can measure how much bromide is left at the end of the deployment to know how close to equilibrium we uh, achieved. Um, the velocity is measured uh, on a little bit different basis. So um, the velocity, we correlate a mass transfer coefficient of a conservative species to the velocity. So uh, if we put bromide inside a cell, it's going to migrate out. And the rate it migrates out is dependent upon the external velocity. Um, and so uh, to be able to get a little more robust measurement, because we only have one time point, we basically use reservoirs filled with different volumes to surface area. Um, and what that means is that after three weeks, how much bromide has left the cells varies with the surface to volume ratio. So we get a curve of four points with one time point. And we can fit that curve and we can determine this K, which is the mass transfer coefficient. And we know that the mass transfer coefficient is directly proportional to the external velocity uh, based on a combination of both experimental data and model data that we previously published. And so we're able to predict the uh, velocity based on this mass transfer coefficient. And that allows us to get a velocity with every uh, concentration. So with every 10 centimeters or two centimeters, whatever the device's resolution is, you get both the velocity and you get it. Deployed using just uh, standard direct drive technologies. So on the left is an example of one being deployed uh, uh, on the edge of a stream. And this allows us to look at not only what is passing under the stream, but what might be migrating into the stream. Um, this is a, a vibracore. So we're on a boat uh, actually um, off the shore of Rhode Island um, and uh, installing these. Uh, we've installed these in up to 40 feet of water um, offshore without divers. So they're, they're pretty robust and are pretty adaptable. And then of course, for uh, uh, shallow applications, uh, looking at uh, 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 caps or uh, uh, offshore, near offshore upwelling, uh, they can just be hand driven um, down to generally two to four feet is about the maximum you can hand drive before you need something mechanical. Uh, sampling is done in the field. So this is actually um, uh, an example of one of the samplers. Um, we use uh, syringes and we basically uh, extract the water from the reservoirs uh, with a syringe and then we uh, uh, add the water to an appropriate sample container. Um, if you're interested, this is actually a little field lab we set up. Uh, in some cases, the geochemistry is also very important, like, for instance, chlorinated solvents. And so if you have reactive uh, geochemical species like sulfide or iron, uh, you can set up to measure those directly in the field. Um, but for PFAS, that's probably not as large a concern. Uh, so the first field site I want to talk about is kind of a traditional groundwater site. Uh, there was a source zone where there was a, a fire training area, um, and uh, there's a groundwater is migrating uh, down along this arrow. Um, and so what we did was we installed uh, three sets of three strings of samplers in the source zone. That's the red boxes, and we deployed two down gradient. And at each location, we installed a string of uh, passive samplers. We took a core. Uh, we did discrete groundwater monitoring using a geoprobe DPT device. And we conducted um, hydraulic profiling uh, to uh, estimate hydraulic conductivities with depth in order to be able to compare our velocities to traditional measures of velocity. We also measured the concentration of nearby wells, which are the yellow circles. Um, and this was done. Um, uh, uh, the samplers were deployed for about uh, uh, four weeks. Uh, and so this is just a schematic of the depth deployment. So in here, groundwater was around four, a little over four feet below the surface. Um, and you can see that the strings varied in the uh, depth they sampled. So um, this is the source zone. So this one went down to about 24 feet. Uh, these were just 16 and then 24 and 24 down gradient. And we're also showing you um, uh, the, the texture profiles. Um, this was a pretty uniform site, which um, perhaps doesn't um, highlight the abilities of the sampler as much as it could, uh, but it was a uh, uh, available site. There was really only one kind of uh, interesting 
a consistent difference in texture, which is around 12 feet. There was a pretty consistent low permeability zone um, across the site, but otherwise it was generally just a, a fine sand. Um, the sampler uh, has a lot of capabilities because unlike um, uh, methods that you use with groundwater extraction, we're not limited by permeability. So uh, the samplers don't rely on extracting water. So if you have a very low permeability zone like a clay, uh, that doesn't impact our sampler at all, whereas it would be almost impossible to get groundwater from a well out of a, a clay zone. Uh, so the first thing I want to show is just an example of the kind of data that was produced. So I'm just showing five example compounds. We monitored um, all the compounds in EPA 1633 for targeted analysis, and I'm just showing five here. And on the y-axis is depth, so zero to 24 feet, and this is just one location. So we have this for all the locations for all the compounds. Um, and the black dots are the concentrations that uh, were determined using the uh, passive sampling uh, samples, and then the blue are the uh, discrete groundwater samples, and red are the nearest groundwater wells. And I'm doing this for a range of, of sulfonates, um, uh, precursors, um, other compounds. And so one thing I want to notice is you to notice is the excellent agreement between the uh, passive sampling device concentrations and the discrete groundwater samples. Uh, this was a one foot sc temporary screen. Um, and the generally poor correlation with wells. And this is something that's very well known. Um, even wells that are fairly close, you know, 10, 15, 20 feet, um, the spatial variation is huge. And so um, both the, the, the uh, spatial resolution with distance, but also with depth. And when you have five foot or four foot well screens, um, you're sampling over multiple zones. Typically, you're only getting the, the, the most hydraulically conductive zone. And so the concentrations are, are, are fairly poor indicators of what's going on at any individual depth or location, um, whereas the discrete samples give you a, a much finer profile. Um, we also did non-target abundances, so not only the targeted compounds. So for non-target, we can't actually predict a concentration because there are not analytical standards available, but we can look at relative abundances. And so I'm showing again depth on the y-axis from uh, 0 to 24 feet below surface, and then uh, relative abundance on the x. And again, the black are uh, the passive sampling concentrations. The blue are the discrete groundwater samples. And again, you can see excellent uh, uh, correlations uh, for all of these different non-target species. But the sampler can do way more than just concentration profiles. So because we measure velocity to depth, we can also look at mass fluxes. Um, and so the first graph um, is showing the velocity uh, estimates you, for two different techniques. The red is velocity tech, uh, estimates using the hydraulic conductivity measurements uh, of the hydraulic profiling tool combined with site water gradients and combined with estimates of porosity. And the black is the measured uh, velocities uh, by the uh, passive sampler. And there's reasonable agreement. Um, and so if you then combine these velocities at each depth with estimates of concentration, either with the uh, discrete groundwater samples or the HRIP, you can then calculate a flux, a mass per meter squared uh, day, uh, which is really important to understand um, how much PFAS is actually migrating uh, 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 away from your source zone or across your site. And so again, the black is the mass flux calculated using the uh, velocity predicted by the HRIP and the concentrations measured by the HRIP, and the red is the flux measured by the uh, predictions of groundwater velocity using traditional methods and discrete groundwater. Uh, and so pretty good agreement between the mass flux. Um, this is uh, two sites, and I'm showing you uh, PFOA for both sites. But again, you would have this for every species, not only targeted, but non-target as well. Another thing that we found that we could do is to... Um, calculate uh, not only site-specific partition coefficients, but depth-specific partition coefficients. So again, at this site, it was fairly uniform. There wasn't a lot of change. But at some sites, they're very heterogeneous. And the partition coefficients are going to change based on the formation uh, composition, how much organic carbon, how much clay, silt, whatever. And so I'm showing you examples of two compounds, PFOA and 6,2 FTS. 
again, the, the y-axis is depth below surface. Um, and the red uh, squares are the soil concentrations. So we took cores at every site and were able to measure the concentration in the soil. And then I'm showing three measures of the pore water concentration. The black, again, is the passive sampler concentrations. The light blue are the discrete groundwater samples. And the green are the nearby well samples. And so if you take the pore water concentrations at each depth and the soil concentrations at each depth, you can calculate a depth-specific partition coefficient. I th um, the uh, uh, relatively good agreement between the uh, uh, partition coefficients predicted by the HRIP versus the uh, discrete groundwater for PFOA. But if you cross over to 6.2, you can see that while the soil concentrations and the soil concentrations are really well correlated using the HRIP data, it's not so for the discrete groundwater. And that's simply a function of the discrete groundwater samples. We only took six, um, which would be a lot typically. Uh, but this depth just missed this peak concentration profile. Um, it's, there's nothing wrong with the groundwater sample. It's just at the wrong, slightly at the wrong depth. So you miss a, a peak concentration, which means you would not capture this partition coefficient. I'd also say that the groundwater samples were the least useful. Uh, this is crossing over four orders of magnitude, and that's just not realistic for a partition coefficient. Um, the uh, partition coefficients based on the ATRIP and even the, the discrete groundwater samples are much more consistent with depth as you'd expect at a site with a fairly uniform material. Um, and the um, ATRIP are by far the most consistent. So the, the other site we have was a, a, a site where there's a, a groundwater plume that's surfacing into a surface water. So this is the, the groundwater plume and it uh, intersects this pond um, in this little uh, pocket. And so we installed, um, I think, a 25 um, uh, passive samplers across this little uh, bay. Uh, we used put samplers at the one foot contour, the three foot contour, uh, four foot, six foot, and eight foot water depth. Uh, and these samplers uh, ranged in what depth, uh, uh, sediment depth they evaluated. So these were generally zero to two feet below surface. And then these were generally zero to four feet. But there was a transect where we did zero to eight feet across it as well. Um, so uh, roughly four to eight feet in depth that we evaluated in water depths ranging from one feet to eight feet. Um, we compared our data to a couple of their techniques. So we also did pisometers where we could, um, and we put in seepage meters where we could. The seepage meters, we could only get to three feet because we didn't have access to divers. Um, and then you can see here, this little flag, that's actually one of the HRIP passive samplers in the sediment. Um, and the pisometers, we uh, didn't do at every location, but we did a subset. It would have taken way too long to do that many pisometer measurements. Uh, but we also had problems with the pisometer in that there was a, a layer of fairly fine grain material that we were not able to actually get any water out of. So um, uh, I guess a limitation of traditional techniques. And then I also just wanted to point out that there was a layer of fairly coarse gravel at this site, uh, and we didn't have any problem getting the passive samplers driven through this with the uh, Viber core. Uh, and this is the boat that we used to install the samplers. It's, it's a fairly small boat. Um, it was able to get to very shallow water. Um, and the VibraCore was easily able to uh, install all the samplers. So this is just a, a really high level overview of what we can do with this data. Um, so on the left, um, I'm showing you the average PFAS concentration for every location we looked at. And in this case, I'm just showing zero to two feet below the sediment surface. So the average concentration over zero to two feet. Keep in mind that we have a, a, a discrete concentration value um, every two centimeters for the uh, one foot profile and every 10 centimeters or less for all the others. So there's a very fine level of, of resolution here. I'm just letting you visualize what the, the, the type of data you would get. So here it's really easy to see that there's this highly impacted zone moving offshore um, and moving offshore way further than most people had suspected. Uh, originally, most of the, the current thought was that it was all going to be migrating really near shore. And actually, it's it's more impacted offshore. Um, but, but this is a pretty crude thing that we can use this data for. It's just kind of visualizing where are the most impacted zones, although it's very useful. Um, if we take this and we look at the specific depth resolution, so on the right, I'm showing a, a single compound, PFOS, 
I'm showing zero to four feet below the surface on the y-axis. And then the x-axis is zero to about 200 feet along the three foot contour. So we're basically starting here and we're moving along this three foot contour on the X axis. And then the colors obviously indicate the amount of PFOS we measured. Um, and each one of these locations is composed of 20 or 30 at least measurements in the vertical uh, direction. And so that allows us to have a, a cross section of where the PFAS is in respect not only to depth, but also cross. And if we were to combine this cross section with the cross sections at four feet, six feet, eight feet, and one feet, then of course, then you develop a three-dimensional picture of how the PFAS is migrating um, into the pond, where are the most uh, uh, critical locations, any hot spots. And if you combine it with the velocities, you then get uh, an actual impact because then you have a flux. Where is the flux highest into the pond? So if you want to know where to go get the biggest bang for your buck in terms of remediation, this will allow you to identify the sites. It would also allow you to look at the biotic zone, this top 10, 15 centimeters to say, where is the biotic zone being most impacted? So a, a lot you can do with data like this. So, so some kind of high level conclusions, um, the ATRIP technology can evaluate uh, uh, PFAS concentration with depth at centimeter resolution, including both target and non-target species. Uh, it can estimate pore velocity and max flux. Uh, provides additional data on geochemistry and conservative uh, transport of species um, and is able to be deployed and retrieved at about the same time required to collect samples using other technologies, but it provides vastly more data. Um, major advantages and benefits, um, the ability to monitor low permeability zones and vertical spatial variability. So this was a very simple sites I've shown you, but there are certainly much more complex layered sites out there that you really need high resolution for. Um, it's able to be deployed in locations with overlying water without divers and using commonly available direct drive equipment. Uh, the resolution is customizable, so you don't have to have a sample every 10 centimeters if you don't want it. Um, but if you want to get that resolution, you can get from uh, as high as two centimeter resolution. Uh, and there's no need to stabilize wells or posometers, uh, basically producing less waste. Some examples of some benefits to DOD. Uh, for this technology could be used for initial site assessments. So before you go out and spend a lot of money to put wells in, to be able to find, you know, where do you really want those wells? Where are the critical areas? To evaluate mass flux and source zones, uh, down gradient or to surface water, um, which is uh, a, a critical factor. And if you're gonna, you know, need to do something active. Um, developing higher fidelity site conceptual models or transport models. For transport models, you're not only gonna get better vertical resolution of concentrations, but also of velocities and also of partition coefficients, which would greatly aid in uh, these site models. It could be used to evaluate remedial activities such as carbon injection. Uh, carbon injection is very likely to be you know, uh, non-uniform. So if you wanna know how well the carbon was distributed, uh, what, how uniform is the impact, uh, this would be a great way to do that. Um, looking at a low permeability zones or the potential for mass rebound, which is a big worry when you have some kind of fine uh, textured layer and you're worried about, yeah, if we clean it up, are we going to have to come back in five years? Uh, with this technique, you can actually determine how much mass is left in that fine zone. Um, and then evaluating the biotic zone exposure. So I think with that, um, oh, I missed a slide. Sorry, I do want to acknowledge the other PIs, um, uh, Dr. Jennifer Guelpho and Dr. Todd Anderson at Texas Tech. Um, and then Paul Hatzinger and Greg Lavornio at Aptim. And then um, uh, three great uh, graduate students that did the bulk of this work, uh, Morgan, Michaela, and Jessica. Um, and with that, I'll be uh, happy to answer anyone's questions. Great, thank you, Andrew. And just a reminder to our audience, um, please type in questions in the Q&A box in the Zoom screen for Andrew. Um, the first question is whether the stainless steel membrane used um, in your approach um, is commercially available? And if so, uh, is there, and the second part is, is there any PFAS absorption, adsorption information available? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. So I didn't present it here because I was just so short on time. I wanted to focus on the field data, but there was a, a, a large lab study that basically supported this uh, prior to going to the field in which we evaluated the impact of membranes on PFAS. And the, the stainless steel membrane is commercially available. It's uh, available through Paul 
Um, it's basically a stainless steel centered membrane. It, it comes in sheets and can be cut to any dimension you want. Um, and we uh, 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 carefully looked at whether there were going to be interactions. And, and the answer is no, there's not really interactions until you get to really long chain or, or the really heavy um, uh, precursors. And even then, it, it's fairly minor. Um, but with the three to four week deployment, the nice thing about an equilibrium process is that even if there is a small amount of interaction, once that's saturated, which occurs really quickly, the, the uh, reservoir of water will still equilibrate. And so the lab results all show that within three to four weeks, um, you basically get to, um, you know, 80 to 100 percent equilibrium. OK, and then um, just following up, um, is the overall technology commercially available? Uh, sort of. <laughs> <laughs> For, 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 for other species, yes. The chlorinated solvents, these have been used multiple times now, um, and there are um, a, a couple of different companies that will provide the surface. Um, uh, they, um, for PFAS, because it's a demonstration project, you know, I, no one's done it commercially yet, um, but because the technology is basically identical to what we use for chlorinated solvents, we just used a different membrane. Um, um, there's no reason why it couldn't be. Um, but I don't know of a company right now that would uh, turnkey it for you um, for PFAS. I think that's hopefully going to come out of this work is that this will demonstrate to people that the technology works for PFAS just like it does for other um, uh, uh, contaminants and that um, it'll be easily available. Um, it's certainly available through me, um, uh, but uh, hopefully a company picks it up to make it a little bit easier. Okay, thank you. Is it possible to generate sufficient sample volume for PFAS analysis with a commercial lab? Um, so it depends. Um, the, the reservoir volume can be customized depending on what you want. Um, right now, at every depth, we have duplicate cells, which allows you um, uh, the ability to look at um, uh, variability, but it also allows you to combine volumes. So in general, each cell produces about 10 mils of water. So you get about at most 20 mils per depth. Um, and so, you know, compared to the full 1633 pre-concentration method using SPEMI, where they want hundreds of mils, no. Um, but uh, we're using direct injection. Um, there's no reason uh, why uh, someone couldn't do the uh, pre-concentration method with less volume. Um, I don't think it's needed. The, the direct injection works great. We did a comparison study between a, a certified lab and showed that the method we used gave equivalent results as the uh, EPA 1633. We still use all the other attributes of 1633, in, including the uh, non-extracted and extracted internal standards and all of that. Um, we just don't do the pre-concentration because it's not really needed. Okay, thanks. Um... Were there specific challenges that were encountered while you were working with the samplers in the field? For example, did you encounter biofouling as an issue? No, the, the, the biofouling is not really an issue here. Um, uh, the deployments even over three or four weeks, um, I mean, these samplers, this technology, not for PFAS, but in general, the diffusive equilibrium samplers, PEEPERS is a common name for them. They've been around since the seventies um, and have been used um, for all types of things. Um, uh, and so uh, no one's ever really documented any impacts of, of biofouling. There's, um, and, and the thing is, because it's an, a diffusive process, um, you know, the, the biofouling layer would have to get pretty thick uh, before it would significantly retard. And you, we've never seen that in the field. Okay. Um, what about cost? How does the cost for this approach compare to other site evaluation methods? So in terms of the, the, the use of the samplers, the, their, the cost of the sampler, the deployment and the retrieval, um, previous work has shown that's fairly comparable to other technologies. Um, it, but again, that question is really dependent upon how much spatial resolution you want. If you only want one depth, then the cost here is more than putting in a well. If you wanna have uh, discrete samples at multiple depths at multiple locations, then our cost actually becomes less. So it, it's really hard because the cost question is also a question of how much resolution do you want? How many samples are you gonna analyze? Um, but in general, the, the deployment and retrieval costs are fairly typical of any kind of direct drive. I mean, 
it's a it's a geoprobe or a vibracore, which you're going to need regardless. Um, and the only difference is that we're putting in a sampler and taking it back out after three weeks, as opposed to taking a discrete groundwater sample, moving down, uh, equilibrating, taking another sample. Um, so because the time of deployment is fairly similar, the cost of deployment is fairly similar. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. All right, at this time, we'd like to bring Upal uh, back onto the line, and we have a couple of questions um, to follow up with both of our speakers. Um, first, um, Upal, we'll have you answer this one first and then go to Andrew. There's a question about whether, um, you know, in the field, changing environmental dynamics could somehow influence the accuracy of the sampling results and their reliability. So, you know, if the environment is shifting and changing, how would that affect the sampling method? Upal first. Yes, so I think that's an, uh, that's an uh, intriguing question. There's so many things that change in the environment. So first of all, the concentration itself could be changing and very often changes in the field with uh, precipitation and groundwater flow. And then as you get closer to the coastal system with tidal uh, influences and so forth. Um, so we get concentration change and there could be other changes in terms of flow velocity and so forth, right? Um, so the accuracy is an important one to think about. Um, we have, so for passive sampling that um, operates over a period of time, say for the PFAS passive samplers, we are saying less than seven days. When we are looking at some of the other passive samplers for which uh, the technology is being actively used now for uh, hydrophobic compounds, um, the period of time to get to, to equilibrium is quite large in the months, uh, especially for the more hydrophobic compounds. Um, so then the question is, what is the time period of integration? So we have a paper that's going to come out on the mathematical interpretation of what time integration in passive sampling really means. But what I think the uh, way to think about this is um, any receptor like uh, uh, phytoplankton floating in the water column or a fish um, in uh, uh, breathing the water through the gills is experiencing those changes over time. And that's somehow getting, uh, influencing the net uptake that's happening in the organism over time. And even that's, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of this in the context of being able to predict concentrations in organism, aquatic organisms. Uh, that's one of the key um, uh, 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 uses, you, 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 uh, use of uh, passive sampling derived data. Um, so the organism in the field is also experiencing those concentration changes and is integrating that over time. So what we have seen is that for some of the smaller molecules, the time period of integration may be short. And so um, it, one has to be very careful about deployment times. So if you deploy some of these equilibrium passive samplers for too long, it's not necessarily, so if you put it out, so for example, my passive sampler, which the way I have designed it is equilibrating within seven days. If I put it out for a month, I'm not actually getting a one month period of integration. I'm getting the last seven months, seven days of uh, um, information in that passive sampler because the older information gets washed out of the sampler. So I don't know if I'm answering the question fully uh, from, um, uh, 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 the audience here, but um, one has to be very careful looking at the kinetics and looking at what that means in terms of that time period of integration. So it would average out in a way the concentrations experienced by the sampler over that period of deployment. If it goes through big fluctuations in the field, then um, if that big fluctuation happens closer to the day of retrieval, that will have a more stronger impact on the overall measurement. Okay. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. Thank you. Um, Andrew, what are your thoughts? Um, so yeah, I'll divide up, you know, there's two things that can vary. The concentration of the species you're interested in can vary. And then the other things in the water 
can vary. So in terms of the concentration of the, of the specific PFAS, you know, generally those don't change by um, an order of magnitude over the, a couple of weeks um, in most systems that I'm aware of. You know, groundwater doesn't flow that quickly. Concentrations are, don't change that quickly, even in, or in sediment where the velocities are typically much lower. Um, and so our sampler is, is not truly an integrated sampler. It, it also is going to mainly reflect the last couple of weeks concentration more than the older. But if the concentration is going up and down, the, the, the equilibrium does respond to that. So it's not a true integrated concentration over the deployment period, but it it's if the concentration is changing, it's going to partially reflect that. Um, it's mainly going to reflect the, the the more recent time period rather than the more older. If other things in the water are wor you're worried about, like pH or TDS or velocity, um, the sampler is pretty immune to that. Um, higher velocities are going to make it uh, equilibrate faster slower, slower, but we basically designed it so that there's no velocity, it still equilibrates. So it's just going to make it better if the, the velocity is changing upwards. And it's really um, not impacted by changes in TDS or um, pH or other things you might be interested in. Okay, great. Thank you, Andrew. And with that, we're going to wrap up the webinar. Thank you so much to both of our presenters today for the presentations and the answers to the questions. Our next webinar in the CERTIP and ESTCP webinar series is on Thursday, August 22nd, and that is on DOD-funded research efforts to develop climate change assessment tools for use at DOD facilities. Please visit the CERTIP and ESTCP webinar webpage for this and all the other webinars through the end of 2024. You can register for all of those. I'd like to remind you both the audio and a copy of the presentation from today will be archived on the webinar webpage in case you want to refer to them. We would appreciate it now if you could please take a moment to complete the survey that will pop up on your screen. And this concludes today's webcast. Thank you. Thank you.